Boom! Welcome into Sports Bit. Betting Insight today, Polly and Teddy. Monday, May 22nd. Big game breakdown. Can the Warriors get out the broom on the Spurs? And that line is getting crazy. We'll talk about that game. And as the Warriors try to get to the Western, to the NBA Finals, also deep dive. We start with the AFC East today. Buffalo Bills, new coach, new defensive coordinator. Can they end the longest playout drought in the NFL? And play of the day before we get out of here. That is why we love sports. Who thought the Celtics could go into Cleveland and win after they were blown out in game one and game two and with no Isaiah Thomas? Let's start here. Bad bet. Cavs 13 and a half up to 16 and a half. At the Westgate here in Vegas, ESPN Stats and Info, they had the Cavs as high as a 17-point favorite, the largest conference finals favorite in the last 20 years. Cavs were minus 8,000 on the money line, and the take back was 18 to 1 at the Westgate, highest in town, 19 to 1 at the South Point. Also, this is from a, a, a local, uh, from a viewer rather, everyday viewer. It was 50 to 1 at halftime on five dimes if you thought the Celtics would come back and win. LeBron, 11 points, doesn't score in the fourth. He disappears. Cavs, 2 of 17 from three in the second half. Bradley hits the three. Celtics with the shocker, Teddy. Yeah, and I, I was as shocked as anyone. You know, I mean, Bob, they were down by, what, 21 in the third quarter of that ball game, And then all of a sudden, Marcus Smart starts draining threes, and LeBron James starts missing them. I mean, Le LeBron had about as bad a second half as you'll ever see him have. And Boston starts raining threes. Well, they have seven different guys at at least two uh, three-pointers in that ballgame, uh, Smart being the key. Uh, that was a pretty impressive comeback for Boston. But as we've seen in these NBA playoffs, look, when you can start draining threes, you got a puncher's chance against anybody. Cleveland got a little fat, got a little happy, and Boston made them pay. Chance for a big score. If you were riding the Celtics last night, unfortunately, Polly, I had my fun with Boston on Friday night. I did not come back with the Celtics yesterday, and that ended up being a very bad betting decision for myself, unfortunately. And no record there either. They're trying to break the 88-89 Lakers record for most consecutive playoff wins. That ends as well, so we'll at least get five games there. The total was a bad bet. How about the move on the total? 217 down to 214. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it took a whole bunch of threes for this game to get up and over the total, but it did. Ton of Cavs money, ton of under money. Both of them end up being wrong. How about this tweet from Jason Logan at Covers JLo on Twitter? MLB overs went 10 and 3 on Saturday and are 63, 28, and 2 over the last seven days, 69% to the over, and the total's hitting 54% so far, Teddy. Yeah, incredibly, I had both pushes. <laughs> Jerry, that's, I, I really did. I, 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 but. Uh, look, I'm a guy that loves betting overs in baseball. And you start to see these teams that get on these runs of overs where the lineups are hitting and the bullpens get worn down. It's a concept we've talked about a lot here on Sports, but it's a concept we're going to continue to talk about a lot. Uh, certainly this past week was one of those weeks where the overs were rolling. And for this season, we've seen a legitimate bias towards the overs. You've been nothing but betting overs every day. You've shown a nice profit over the course of the campaign so far, and we've not yet seen the betting markets make significant adjustments upwards. They're inching upwards, but we haven't seen a significant adjustment yet from the betting markets, despite this impressive run of overs, as pointed out uh, by covers J-Lo. More bad bets. Reds, 15-cent move, went off the favorite against the Rockies. Amazing but true, Bronson Arroyo has allowed five home runs to pitchers now in his career. Yeah, Kyle Freeland had two hits and a walk. Uh, on base in all three of his uh, plate appearances as Colorado uh, gets the win. Arroyo giving up another dinger to another pitcher. And Arroyo's basically given up dingers to everybody so far this season. I was very surprised to see the money come on Cincinnati, considering how much anti-Bronson Arroyo money we've seen uh, over the course of his uh, first half dozen starts or so. And bad for the books, a ton of them. Uh, Dodgers-Marlins over, better from 8.5 to 9. Over minus 125, nine and a half at some shops, and the game lands nine thanks to a solo shot by the Marlins uh, in the ninth. Yeah, Justin Bauer with a ninth inning solo shot. Otherwise, the books were in line to clean up on this ballgame. Think about it. all that over money. Eight and a half, up to nine, up to nine minus 15, nine minus 20, nine minus a quarter. Some of the books started moving to nine and a half, and there they are. All they need is three outs in the ninth, and they're going to cash it all. Instead, 
the vast majority of those total bets either push or win one for the betters, bad one for the books. All right, 40 cent moves here. Cardinals, 150, as high as 190. They beat the Giants 8 to 3. Matt Kane, 3 0 on the road with a 119. 0 oh, 2 on the road with an ERA just shy of 9. Cubs, 40 cent move. 180 up to 220. They were all over the Brewers in that one. And Red Sox and over. They wanted to fire against that A's bullpen, and the Red Sox get a win on the road. Yeah, Kane splits, by the way. At home, he's got a 1.19 ERA. On the road, his ERA is just shy of 9. Betters were very aware of that split. Looking to fade Kane there. And the Cubs, you know, uh, they made a move in the lineup. We talked about Kyle Schwarber, and maybe he wasn't the right guy for the leadoff spot. Well, we weren't the only ones thinking that. Schwarber's been dropped to number two in the order. Ben Zobrist moved up to leadoff, and Chicago responds with a 12-3 blowout over the Brewers. And look, the Red Sox had lost all the first three games of that series in Oakland, and betters were not shy about betting on Boston in that contest. Uh, Sox piled on late six runs over the last two innings against that dicey Oakland A's bullpen. And also hockey, game five. How about that? Seven nothing Penguins. Bad result for the books. They now lead that series three games to two. And not a lot of drama on the final day of the Premier League, where you just had who was going to qualify for the Champions League. Arsenal, Liverpool, and Man City, big favorites. They all win. You know, a lot of these matches went over, too. Tottenham with another, uh, they had seven goals as well. Kane. Uh, with a hat trick, 29 goals, fifth player, back-to-back -back golden boots in that one. Arsenal fails to qualify for the Champions League for the first time since 96-97. So I like how they do that. I love relegation, but all 10 matches go on at the same time with the rotating scores in the corner, but no, no drama there. And tomorrow on the show, Nigel Seeley to preview the Europa Final and the Champions League Final with Real Madrid and Juventus. Up next, big game breakdown. Can the Warriors get out the brew on Sportsbit? Betting Insight today on SBRPicks.com. Go to SBRodds.com. Browse, compare, and shop live odds available at top online sportsbooks. Back on Sportsbit, Betting Insight today. Paulie and Teddy, time for a big game breakdown. As always, SBR Odds and SportsbookReview.com. Make sure you check out the rating guide. Make sure you're betting with a trustworthy shop out there. Here we go. Game four. Warriors looking to uh, sweep the Spurs. Kawhi, as we tape this, already downgraded to doubtful. It opened 12, excuse me, opened 9, 215. You saw it, but up to 12, 216. As high as 12 and a half and 217. 12 and a half's all over Vegas. Back down to 216 with the total. They didn't have Parker. They didn't have Leonard. And then David Lee actually gave him a boost in the first quarter. And then he got hurt too, Teddy. Yeah, Lee's a very questionable uh, for this game uh, as well. So, you know, it's a Spurs team that let's call it what they are. You know, they fought the fight. They're not winning this series. They're probably not winning this game, although we said the same thing about the Boston Celtics going into game three at Cleveland, but it's a difference when you're down 2 nothing versus down 3 nothing, And it's a Golden State team that may be able to learn from the lessons that Cleveland taught them yesterday, which is, gee, don't think you have it won when you got a 21-point lead in the third quarter. And look, you know, the books got destroyed. I mean, the books did not have a good weekend. You know, we didn't really talk about it in the opening segment, how badly they lost the NBA games on Friday and on Saturday. The books took an absolute beating, and I mean a bloodbath on both of those contests. It was Square City, uh, and all the parlays hit, and there was an enormous amount of liability, and there are sportsbook directors here in Las Vegas who will be called into, you know, the GM's office on Monday explaining what the hell happened in the NBA. Uh, this past weekend. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, I mean, the the, the Spurs uh, first half didn't get there against Golden State, but let's not forget the money came on Golden State for the first half in that game. That was one and a half and two, and up closing, you know, four, four and a half uh, on that contest, Polly. Well, no, Kawhi, that's a huge difference. I, I was surprised he didn't play. Uh, but they, they got Durant going again. He was, he, got, he was in a rhythm. Mike Brown actually did a pretty good job. Uh, the Warriors had that lead going into the fourth quarter, and then when the Spurs made a quick run, then he put Durant back on the floor, which, again, you have two of the five best players in the NBA. Why would you sit him at the same time? But here's the Brown quote. KD got in a groove. He would choose for us. A huge for us little. We didn't do anything tricky. He got hot. We wanted to keep him in the middle of the floor, attacking downhill in pick-and-roll situations. He was terrific. He made the right play every time down the floor and made shots. He is who he is. On the other side, Ginobili, 
He's been a total pro in these playoffs, 21 points in 17 minutes. And he said, quote, we knew we were going to be able to bounce back at least emotionally today and play a better game. The fact is that it's just too tough. We're missing Kawhi's offense and defense. They were too much for us today offensively. KD got hot in the moment when we had a chance, end quote. Uh, you know, this is another thing, too. Maybe a blessing in disguise that Pachulia was out. McGee needs to get more minutes. McGee is a great fit on this team. McGee had 16 points in 13 minutes for the Warriors. He needs more playing time. Sure, but, I mean, it, you know, it's hard to get playing time on a team with four All-Stars. Look at the quote uh, from Greg Popovich. Our competitiveness was great. Every time you look up, you're playing against four All-Stars, so you better be pretty perfect. And competitive-wise, I couldn't ask for anything more. This, again, a coach of a team that just lost by double digits at home in a must-win Game 3 situation. So that's Coach being honest. His team is not as good as Golden State. They know it. <laughs> you know, uh, Golden State knows it. Uh, and, uh, I mean, Manager Nobly knows it, you know. Uh, I mean, talking about how they bounce back emotionally. And Ginobili, I mean, this last call for Ginobili, it might be. You know, he's scoring 21 points in less than 18 minutes, doing everything he can possibly do. It doesn't matter. These te- You know, right now, Golden State's here. San Antonio's here. And there's a pretty big difference between these two. Whether it's a difference enough to cover a 12, 12 and a half point spread is another question entirely. A lot of it's going to have to do with what Golden State brings mentally in the second half of this ball game, but I'm convinced that from a straight-up perspective, we're not likely to see the type of upset we saw yesterday. The Warriors a little bit smarter than the uh, Cavaliers when it comes to protecting a big lead in the postseason. Game number two, live odds, sportsbookreview.com. Royals and Yankees. Yankees $1.78 the total. Vargas against Pineda, quick rematch of the 11-7 win on Wednesday. Yankees won. They were up 6-0 in the fourth and 10-2 in the fifth. Vargas entered the game at 5-1 with an ERA of 1, best ERA in baseball. He allowed more earned runs in that game than he had all season. Through 49 pitches in the fourth inning, 10 batters coming to the plate. Girardi, quote, we were patient on Vargas and made him work. We put guys on base and we hit home runs. Good combination. Vargas asked if he would bounce back in the long run probably, but the fact of the matter was the only game that mattered was tonight and getting us back into the winner's category and get us moving in the right direction. Again, never easy to swallow when you're not able to to get out of an inning, and he had a good opportunity a couple of times to get out of that inning. What do you think happens the second time around with a uh, short turnaround? Another look at him. Well, when you have a short turnaround second look against a hurler that got absolutely destroyed the first time, there's only one question to ask. What's going to be different this time around? Because what the Yankees were able to do in that first meeting, they were patient at the plate, consistently working counts. When you're talking about a 10-batter inning, it was over and over and over. I mean, so with 40-plus pitches in a single inning, when the Yankees are patient at the plate, man, this offense is really good. (laughs) And you would expect that they'll have that same patience on the second look. The the only concern is, might the hitters be a little bit too aggressive because that first time was so easy? Remember, for as talented as that young Yankees lineup is, it's not the most mature lineup in baseball. Uh, as of yet and that's my biggest concern about the Bronx Bombers ability to hit Vargas this evening if they're too aggressive it might hurt them but generally I think it's a good spot for the Yankees against a pitcher they destroyed last week what do you think of Pineda well I mean Pineda was Pineda last time out you know it's the same story we've seen from him over and over again he threw a ton of good pitches but when he misses the guy gets punished Salvador Perez went yards on him Whit Merrifield went yards on him and you look at his numbers, you know, he's 4-2 and two with a 3.42 ERA. The XFIP of 2.79 says this guy isn't even living up to real expectations, but that shows what he would be if he just allowed home runs at a league average rate. But his issue, you know, I mean, I wonder if his control is a little bit too good. He's got a weird combination. Number six in strikeout percentage, also number four in walk percentage. Usually the high strikeout guys intimidate hitters. But Pineda's control is so good, he's only hit one batter all season. He might be a little bit better if he was wilder, knocked some guys down, so they wouldn't get quite as comfortable in the box going up against him. We'll get back to this game with the play of the day. Up next, they haven't made the playoffs since 1999. We start with the AFC East and the Buffalo Bills on Sportsbit. Betting Insight today on SBRPicks.com. Research before you bet. 
be sure to check out SPR Picks for the best game predictions, breakdowns, and much, much more. Back on Sports Bit, time for the deep dive. Last couple weeks, we did the NFC West, and now it's on to the AFC East. Nigel Seeley tomorrow to uh, talk soccer, and then we'll finish out the AFC East the rest of the week. It'll be fun to talk about the Patriots as well. In some places, they're aligned at 12 and a half. The Buffalo Bills, win total six and a half, over 135. Last year, seven and nine straight up, six and 10 ATS, 12 and four to the over. How about that? Four and two start, including wins over Arizona and New England. I know Brady wasn't there in Garoppolo, but despite Roman getting fired after week two, six and five heading into December, they also had that huge Monday night loss in Seattle when they had first and goal to win the game and couldn't cash in, but they were live for the playoffs. A one and four stretch to end it. The lone win at Cleveland, Rex Ryan out the door. I mean, this is a Bills team that was favored in half their games last year, Paulie. Eight times they were chalk. They went three and five against the spread in those contests. Just two and six straight up in games decided by a touchdown or less. In fact, just one and five straight up in games decided by less than a touchdown. So when it came to close games, their failure in Seattle was not the only one. They repeatedly came up a little bit short trying uh, to uh, uh, win the tight ones. They couldn't do it a season ago. Now, you look at the key stats, uh, 18 takeaways, 12 giveaways, number two, plus six was uh, – Seventh in the league. Offense, 5.6 yards per play on offense, right around league average, 5.3 yards per rush. Number one in the NFL by far. Number two behind Dallas in rushing attempts, so at least they could figure out their strength. 29 rushing touchdowns led the NFL too. 6.9 yards per pass, below average, and 29th uh, in sacks allowed too. Defense, 85.9 QB rating allowed was 11th. 39 sacks was 8th. 4.6 4.6 yards per rush allowed was 28th. A lot of changes here, as we mentioned. Rex out the door. McDermott takes over as head coach, the former D.C. with Carolina. New GM. Remember, Doug Whaley. We talked about this on the show, Teddy. They fired Whaley and the entire scouting squad after the draft. Yeah, it was a weird situation. Let me go back to the stats for just a minute because a couple of those really stand out. All right, the Buffalo Bills were a sub-500 team last year, and yet... They didn't turn the ball over all year. Only 12 giveaways. That was number two in the NFL. I don't think that Buffalo's going to only have 12 giveaways this season. That's a concern right off the bat. I mean, you're talking about a team that was number one in the NFL in yards per rush. I mean, way ahead of Dallas. You know what I mean? And it says so clearly the NFL is not a run-first league. But all of the stats with Buffalo, all of them. They were decent on defense, you know, uh, decent in terms of the pass pressure, decent in terms of the uh, opponent, opponent's QB rating allowed. You know, they weren't particularly good in terms of their own yards per pass, but the stats were not stats of a squad that was non-competitive. And they weren't competitive a season ago. Didn't matter for Sexy Rexy, obviously, but now uh, we're talking about a guy named Sean McDermott, the former Panthers defense coordinator, and the early reports on McDermott is that, quote, number one, he's a detail guy, (laughs) and that number two, he's working on everything up-tempo. Quote, this is from the new GM, Brandon Bean, he's going to want everything regimented out. We're going to be bam, bam. We're not going to be walking around the field. We're going to run from this drill to this drill, from this period to this period. You're going to see that. That's how he's wired and what he's used to, and we've already seen that from the Bills in their first uh, OTAs uh, this uh, offseason. But it was a really weird situation with that, you know, Whaley. And it wasn't just Whaley getting fired. The entire scouting staff got fired one day after the draft. And the reports out of that draft room, uh, Paulie say, was very awkward with McDermott making changes to Whaley's draft board. The new GM, as we said, uh, Brandon Bean. But new offensive and new defensive coordinators as well, Uh, Paulie. A lot of changes for the Bills in terms of their coaching staff. Yeah, also something to watch. If they get up to a hot start, they better because McDermott took out the pool table and the video games. I wonder how that'll play in the locker room, especially if the players don't like them and they get up to a slow start. New OC is Rick Dennison. Didn't exactly wow the NFL as the Broncos OC under Kubiak and also with the Houston Texans. Leslie Frazier, the defensive coordinator, former Vikings head coach, uh, also then Tampa Bay D.C., Last year, the secondary coach in Baltimore, so he's moving in the wrong direction. 
They are transitioning back to a 4-3 defense. Tyrod Taylor coming back. I would say underrated. Seventh in QBR la uh, 2015. Ninth last year ahead of Brothelsberger, Rivers, Wilson, Carr, Newton, Flacco, Palmer, and Dalton. Top off season needs. Wide receiver, corner, outside linebacker, DB, and offensive line. They're saying Watkins has been re-energized in the offseason off workouts. Can't stay healthy. Been a major disappointment that they traded picks to move up and get him. Yeah, I mean, let's start with Tyrod Taylor because this is a guy who's gotten no love. He's gotten no love from the fans. He's gotten no love from the media. He's gotten no love from the Bills organization because he was looking for a long-term deal. And yet, we're talking about a guy who's been top 10 in QBR in each of the last two years. And he's done it with a spotty offensive line and a really up-and-down receiving core. So, I mean, you talk about Sammy Watkins being re-energized in off-season workouts. This is a guy that caught 28 passes, 430 yards last year. And Tyrod Taylor still finished number nine in QBR. I like the move to re-sign Taylor. And certainly, if they're going to be better this year, Sammy Watkins is going to have to be a big part of it. But they opened up the checkbook a little bit when it came to free agency, uh, Polly. A couple of moves that I think will help them. Micah Hyde comes over from Green Bay to shore up the secondary, replacing Gilmore, who went to New England. Poyer brings safety help from Cleveland as well. And they also uh, signed a fullback, DeMarco, from uh, Atlanta, who's the best, arguably the best blocking fullback over the past two seasons. With that number one rushing attack, they should flourish uh, in Dennis, uh, Dennison's offense as well. They signed Tolbert because McCoy was miserable in uh, short yardage situations as well. What do they do in the draft, though? Well, top three picks. I mean, you get your uh, Tredavious White from LSU. Uh, after they traded away, remember, they had the number 10 pick. They traded They traded down. Uh, nice move. And I think he'll be the one that ends up actually replacing Gilmore, but he's a cornerback who should start right away as a rookie. Uh, in the second round, uh, they get Zay Jones from East Carolina. He's another guy who was expected to start as a rookie, an impact receiver. And their second pick in the second round, Deion Dawkins, the guard out of Temple, who is the third guy with the potential to start right away for the Buffalo Bills. All right, what do you have on the schedule? Well, this is the thing that I dislike the most about the Bills. There's a lot to like about this team. You know, I like the QB situation. I like the coaching change. They're not starting from scratch. It's not a teardown, rebuild type situation. And normally you find value with teams like that. You like to bet them over their win total. But from a strength of schedule standpoint, it is a disaster for the Buffalo Bills. Last year... Much easier than average based on teams' records. This year, much harder than average based on 2017 win totals. So along with the Miami Dolphins, we're talking about the two biggest jumps in strength of schedule between last year and this year. The AFC East faces the NFC South and the AFC West. And the thing about those two divisions, no bad teams. Seven of the eight teams in those two divisions are lined at eight wins or higher. And San Diego's at seven and a half. You know, there's no weaklings. And there are two extra games at Cincy and Indy, two teams that are both expected to be better than they were a season ago. So what do you think? Gun to head under? Uh, I don't, you know, I, I, I like the roster. I don't like the schedule. Bills are going to be a clear pass for me. All right, money time. Play of the day. Where are we going? Back to the Yankees and Royals. Teddy, take it away. Absolutely. Game number 907-908. The New York Yankees and Kansas City Royals over eight. We saw a slugfest when these two teams met with this very same pitching matchup at Kauffman Stadium last week. Expecting more of the same in the short turnaround rematch. Yankees and Royals over the total. That's our play of the day. Wednesday. The Dolphins, Thursday, the Patriots, Friday, the Jets, tomorrow, Nigel Seeley to preview the Europa, Europa and Champions League final. And as well, we'll talk some soccer with Nigel. Talk to you then on Sportsbit. Betting Insight today on SBRPicks.com. <laughs> <laughs>